Richard Rabich, in your new book, So Much to Do, you talk about the year 1975 and how it changed your life. This was the year when New York City had tremendous financial problems. Why was this so inspiring to you? Well, uh, first of all, I grew up in New York. It's been great for four generations of Ravitches. I always felt I owed it a lot. <clears throat> and um, I was asked by the governor to come in and try to avert bankruptcy of the city and of various public entities in New York. And it was a, a challenge that used my education, my background, my, my knowledge of markets and finance. Uh, and I was able to do something that was useful, publicly useful, and that was great satisfaction. Well, you rose to the challenge and you succeeded. Now you're working on Detroit's <clears throat> bankruptcy. Did the same rules still apply? Um, <clears throat> it's very different. New, New York a city represented to New York State a much more important and bigger part of their economics than Detroit does to the state of Michigan. Uh, New York remained the center of finance, the center of entertainment, the center of communications, even in its down period in the 70s. Um, so there are a lot of analogies, but the fundamental difference is that the governor of the state of New York did everything he could, so did the financial community, and so did the labor union leaders, to avert bankruptcy. And we went through a period of six tense, complex, tiring months in which the federal government, the banks, the unions, and the New York State Legislature all ultimately responded and did the very least they could do, but collectively was enough to avert bankruptcy. And you also became lieutenant governor uh, after Elliot Spitzer resigned in disgrace, and he was the so-called sheriff of Wall Street. What do you view as Wall Street's role in New York City, just like the, mo the auto industry uh, leaving Detroit, faltering, was part of Detroit's downfall. What's your view of the relationship between the investment banks and New York City? Well, New York City would suffer egregiously if the financial community were to leave. And because of the technology that exists today, it's more of a risk than it was back in 75. And actually in 75, <clears throat> the banks owned the property that they occupied and they were the largest owner as well as the underwriters of all of New York City's publicly issued debt. So they had a much closer connection to New York than the financial community does today in a globalized world. It doesn't mean they're not as important to the well-being of New York City. They are. From what you've heard so far from New York's new mayor, de Blasio, what do you think about his view of Wall Street? Or is it too, too, too soon to tell? Well, I, I, I think he's on a uh, rapid learning curve, and I'm sure he will understand, if he doesn't already, that uh, the business community is a very, very important partner to have when you are mayor of the city of New York. And as a lifelong New Yorker, finally, is New York City in good shape right now? New York has more problems than it's had for a while. No collective bargaining agreements. Uh, likely to have state aid cut uh, if the governor gets his way. And number two, uh, federal cuts are inexorable as the understandable pressure to reduce federal deficit continues. Pension systems are not adequately fully funded. Um, so do you think you're going to have to come back from Detroit and work on New York City no, again anytime no, soon? No, no, no. The fundamental change that we made in 1975 we passed a law in Albany that required the city to budget in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And the city has never had a financial crisis since. And if every other city in this country and every state were to budget in accordance with some accrual, honest accrual method in which their recurring revenues match their recurring expenses, they wouldn't be in trouble either. Thanks a lot, Richard Ravage. My pleasure to be here. And thank you for watching the stream.